<laughs> now I push the button. Um, okay, I'm, I'm Eric Paul Johnson. And I'm Eric Winsensen. And mm -hmm. I discovered something this week. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you? It took you that long? Yeah, it, I discovered something. Um, I thought we had poltergeists or elves. Oh, in your house? In my house, yeah, that did stuff. Turns out, Joy actually does things. Oh, well, it's nice. And when, I when I mentioned it to her, um, I got a look. I'm sure you did. Yeah, but I found out she does more than just sit there and listen to true crime podcasts and take notes about what they did wrong. Hmm, yeah, you might want to stay on her good side for the duration uh, of the marriage. Till death do us part. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've always noticed something, and I'm wondering what it is. To me, it looks like some kind of starship behind your head on that shelf way up there. Starship. It looks starship. Got... It's white. Oh, uh, there are a couple bags up there, a couple cloth bags up there. Mm -hmm. And then there is an ivory cribbage board. Okay. And before anybody screams, <laughs> it's perfectly legal ivory. It's from walruses. Oh, well, it's a byproduct of uh, Inuit hunting. It, it's uh, something that you're actually encouraged to purchase instead of the stuff that comes from elephants, hmm. which is 100% illegal yeah. for good reason. For Yeah, for good reason. Yeah. With the uh, walruses, they eat the walruses, they use the all the other parts, and then they, ma and then they make uh, a scrimshaw art out of the ivory par portions, um, out of the tusks and everything to sell to people because well because we uh, us and the canadians screwed them just like we screwed everybody else that came that originally lived here so that's uh it's what white people do exactly yes so yes. the least you can do is actually give them some money for it if you're ever there and but that this is probably that's probably from the 1950s or something oh that's cool yeah um we're still behind and we're not going to get ca caught up this week uh we're going to do comments about re point of no return and we're going to do out of luck next week because we've had a whole lot of podcast recording that we've had to do today so i you know i don't want to spend forever on it but we did get to a comment at, uh, at podbean uh from somebody eric and eric hint if all you want to do is dump on jeff's stylistic change after 2000 and the podcast right now i get it you like the bombastic strings. Hashtag me too. But Jeff Ch... And that was it. <laughs> I got an email notice. That was in the email. I went to Podbean to try and find the comment so I could put the full comment, but I couldn't find what song this person commented on. So that's all they left. And uh, I don't know if the person knows what hashtag me too leads to, and that is <laughs> nothing <laughs> to do with yeah. Jeff Lynn's yellow, the podcast or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, unless you've done something that uh, we should know about and uh, that uh, we should cancel you for. Yeah. I know I hate myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I will dump on the stylistic change after 2000 because that's when I got tired of it. I loved the stylistic change that Jeff did in the late 80s with Cloud Nine and Wilburys and, and Armchair Theater and, and Tom Petty and, and the Threedles. But after 10, 20, 30 years of the same sound, it's going to wear on me. And I'm going to please do something that doesn't sound like what you did 25 years ago. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's. You keep looking like you're going to say something, but then again, no, so why? I, I was I was kind of expecting this type of criticism to start cropping up because the moment that we don't love and embrace every single note mm -hmm. at uh, every single repeated repeated note that comes uh, from the songs, then the super fans, yeah, the gatekeepers, <laughs> they start getting no nervous. 
Yeah. And uh, the gatekeeper uh, needs to go um, f- needs needs to go frolic with the key master occasionally and uh, just uh, <laughs> calm down. Uh, oh. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I fully expected this stuff when we started hitting things that sounded like regurgitating 1990 every sing- almost every single song. Um, I think it's kind of creepy cult-like to just like, oh my God, everything that person done has been wonderful. It's great. You've really, he's really done no wrong at all. He's wonderful. Take me to your spaceship and I will follow you whatever I have to do. That's... Um, yeah, nobody's perfect. I'm not, wearing, I'm not wearing Nikes, and I'm not um, I'm not removing anything yeah. of me. Yeah, so. yeah, nobody's perfect. The Beatles recorded some bad songs. Sinatra oh yeah, did some questionable th- songs on um, purpose, uh, usually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he wanted out of that contract. Yeah. <laughs> um. Oh my God! Just look through Elvis. He did a version of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. So. The big names have recorded some really made some really bad recording decisions in their career. That doesn't mean everything they've done has been awful and not everything they've done has been perfect. So Jeff Lynn's great. I love him. I love ELO. I love a lot of the Jeff Lynn solo stuff and the produ- producing stuff. But sometimes in the vast, you know, he's been doing this for almost 60 years, at least you know, with recording contracts and all that kind of thing. So in 60 years of music, you're going to hit some stuff that's like, doesn't do it for me. So, but overall, yeah, I like Jeff. I like ELO. Weird Al's great. He's hilarious. He's brilliant. So you get to things like lasagna and <laughs> some, uh, a buck, some other songs that haven't aged well from the first album. Not well, for any like political... Not for any kind of political reasons or whatever, just because, yeah, that joke might have been funny in 1982, but it's pretty bland now. But overall, I like Weird Al. Doesn't yeah. mean I have to like everything. She drives like crazy. There was no reason for that parody. <laughs> no, Lasagna is a good parody. Yeah. I actually like that one. Now, I want a new duck. <laughs> see i haven't listened to lasagna in a... brilliant is dare to be stupid and eat yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> i haven't listened to lasagna in a long time i don't know it came out at a time where i was like really al another food song so anyway oh taco grande that's got to be one of his worst ones that's gonna go yeah anyway uh do you know ELO podcast. We'll save that for our Weird Al podcast. We already um, beat us with that. Yeah, there's been there are a couple of Weird Al podcasts that are already out there. So yeah, it's been that. Anyways, uh, comments about Point of No Return, and I will get uh, Trevor Raggett says. Oh, go ahead. No, I will get Bob while you read. Oh, you're gonna get Bob. Okay. Yeah. Trevor Raggett says the Point of No Return, eh? Well, let's try to be positive and glass half full about things. This could well be the best track on the Mr. Blue Sky album, by which I mean the least disheartening and depressing one, just by the fact that there isn't an original, infinitely better version to compare it against. Thank heaven for small mercies. Actually, it's a perfectly okay song, likable and entirely forgettable in equal parts, though. However, I disagree with the Eric's in one way. The Mr. Blue Sky album isn't a failure. If anything, it's been a roaring success, a triumph. It's achieved exactly what Jeff and his management were hoping for when they made it, maximizing the personal profits from the greatest hits collection. There's a reason you pretty much only hear the 2012 versions of these songs on soundtracks and adverts nowadays. It's why so many artists have been re-recording their hits, monetization, and licensing, getting around the stranglehold of their old contracts. Eric said, why bother? You get money every time an original version is used on TV and film, but many artists only get a small fraction of the fees because they don't own those recordings. The labels do, and the rubbish contracts artists signed in the 60s and 70s mean that the labels retain most of the profits from those recordings. 
re-record them, and you own the writing credits, the mechanical reproduction rights, the master tapes, and so royalties on those all come back to you and your production company. Okay, maybe there will be, okay, maybe there will have been a tiny amount of Jeff getting them right in the motivation for the MBS album. That sounds like something we should hold a telethon for. Yeah. Uh, but it's also no coincidence that pretty much every surfacing of an ELO tune since has been the re recorded version. Cruella, The Mysterious Benedict Society, Adverts, God bless James Gunn, that he seems to have insisted on an edit of the original. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. So in fact, Mr. Blue Sky really is a huge success, but just not an artistic one, sadly. Yeah, I guess that's a a huge success for Jeff Lynn, um, financially, yeah. For the fans, really haven't heard much praise for it. Um, And yeah, you pretty much only hear the 2012 versions. That extends to the compilations that have come out in the last couple of weeks. Um, there's a compilation called The Vocoder, where there's a, a bunch of songs that feature the vocoder. All of them are, as far as I can, as far as I've seen, I haven't listened to it. I looked over the track listing. Um, all of them are the original songs, except for Mr. Blue Sky. It's from the 2012 version. There's another comp 50th anniversary compilation that's called The Ballads. And Telephone Line and a couple of other songs on there. I think Strange Magic is another one. They're the 2012 versions. Nobody wants to hear the 2012 version of Telephone Line. But that's what's there. Thank God there's a 1976 version that is still out there for everybody to hear and enjoy. And it's perfect original version, not the hollow copy that we got yeah i understand why they do it yeah uh, because yeah record labels um <sighs> yeah <laughs> yeah well, the major labels well a lot of the a lot of the non-major labels are the independent labels question mark the mysterians had to completely re-record both of their albums because i don't i think they may have finally got it back after their after the owner of cameo died mm-hmm. but now most of the band is probably <laughs> tired of touring after all this time um and uh that's what happens when you decide you want to go with a label just because orange is your favorite color <laughs> i suppose so yeah i tell you the one that's really got me upset is and people may laugh at this but i really liked and i still really like the Pac-Man Fever album by Buckner and Garcia. I think it's full of catchy tunes. I like every song on there. The only way you're ever going to hear those songs streaming or online is if you pull it from the original album. Because I don't know why, for some reason, Columbia is sitting on the original album and won't release it for streaming or to sell it. So Buckner, because I think Garcia was dead by that point, um re-recorded all the songs for that album and they sound i mean there's a little bit more life than what's on the mr blue sky album than what jeff Lynn did do his originals but it's still it is not the same it doesn't sound the same so so i have i'm starting to see a theme here unfortunately which is why i why i kind of do feel a little bit guilty about not liking some of this later elo stuff (laughs) yeah because this theme that we have going of any anybody we mention this person died this person <laughs> died this person <laughs> how much of the band is is dead is the entire band yeah i've got bands i like that the entire band is dead um yeah uh <sighs> <laughs> okay well died younger than me ah <laughs> yeah yeah it's more frightening yeah i'm not liking this trend of people in their 50s dying lately so True. right well now that we've i've depressed eric uh rob eben said i disagree with the erics here 
I think Point of No Return is a pretty good song. It's got the hooks, harmonies, and layers we expect from a proper ELO song. And I, and, and I think if there was a full album of songs built around this as a bass, we would say it's a pretty good ELO album. You would. There are know. three albums. <laughs> that <are based. laughs> With this kind of sound as the bass. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we will get into that song by song. Yeah. Aaron Jansen says, it's not a bad song, but also not one that I think to myself, man, I need to listen to that. I am, however, happy to listen, though, when it comes up on my phone's playlist. Speaking of my phone's playlist, for some reason, it seems to pull up the re-recordings more than the originals. Although I prefer the originals, I like listening to the re-recordings to make mental notes on how he changed this or that in the production. The one song that might be the only improved track off of Mr. Blue Sky would be 10538 Overture. I like the soft vocals over the screaming vocals. Um, well, first of all, you need to make playlists that don't involve those 2012 remakes. <laughs> Definitely. That's why, I, that's why I am not tortured by those whenever I'm listening to Spotify or right now I'm building Apple Music playlists or playlists on Apple Music because from what I see, it's better than uh, Spotify. Um, yeah, 10538 Overture? You know, I, I only listened to that once. Um, and the thing that disappointed me was not that it was a hollow remake. It was that I wasn't a fan of the original and with all those cellos crunching into each other. And I'd hoped that, what, at that point, 40 years of production experience would have given him or would have produced a much more pleasing to the ear sound. It, you know, I was hoping, well... Maybe he'll use a full orchestra on here, and we'll get that sort of full orchestra sound that probably should have been on 10538 Overture if, you know, they were a band at the time that had the uh, the the clout to go to a record company and say, yes, we need you to pay for a 40-piece orchestra and a choir on this album that's going to be completely experimental and, you know, it may bomb. So, you guys in on this? So, Moody Blues did it. I th yeah, I oh I don't know. Were, were the, <laughs> but were the Moody Blues established by the time they brought in the orchestras? Not really. They were considered a ha they were considered a one one and gone band by that particular point. And the and the uh, um, the membership had changed. The main membership had changed to mm -hmm. what we know them as now. The yeah. sound had changed more psychedelic. But yeah, they sold in England a little bit, but not really here. Mm -hmm. Plus, also, I think that was, well, it is a little bit different. That was supposed to be a stereo demonstration record originally. Oh, oh, see, there you go. Yeah, yeah, I know. I remember when I, uh, I had heard Go Now many times before, but I, I, I don't know, I think it was when I was 16 that I heard Go Now and then associated, oh, that's the Moody Blues. And I was like, that's the Moody Blues? Because I was like, yeah, wow, really they funny. really changed their sound over a couple of years from Go Now to, you know, Nights in White Satin and that kind of thing. Yeah, Clint Warwick, who was a bass player, got went left, and uh, Denny Lane, who ended up in Wings, yeah. who was a guitarist and lead vocalist, and so he was gone, and uh, and then brought in Justin Hayward and John Lodge, who, which means that Michael Pender didn't have to be the only person writing songs, right? Writing original songs for the band, so yeah, they didn't have to do a bunch of covers, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and we got one last comment here from Astrid Johansson, which was actually my great 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 grandfather's name when he immigrated from Sweden. And to be more American, it was changed to Johnson. <laughs> I love this song. I love it from the very start. I feel good every time I listen to it, and I probably will till my time. <clears throat> and I probably will till my time is up. Well, that's good. I'm glad you like it. I'm glad that people like it. I may not like it, but if other people like it, that's great. I want them to, if you know, like what you want to like, help, you know, help keep ELO out there, help make them keep making them popular. And that's great. I don't like it, but that's, that's me. You probably also don't like spam. I could eat that stuff by the crate load. 
if I wanted to have a heart attack in my 30s, which is why I stopped eating it by the crate load. I recently rediscovered it. Yeah? And how good it is, especially uh, especially uh, when you do the spam sasumi with the seaweed and the rice and everything. All right, so you ruined spam right there. <laughs> um, I usually have a can or two a year now. And they have flavored spams, which is really great. Although I don't see the purpose of bacon spam, since bacon and spam are pretty much made of the same thing. Yeah. Parts is pork from the pig. Parts is parts. Parts is parts, and it's overly salty, yeah. like bacon. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah they, no, I just like spam flavored spam. They got uh, jalapeno, they got hot and spicy. I believe there's a one that's got cheese, you know, worming its way through it. Um, yeah, there are all kinds of flavors of spam that are out there now. Chorizo flavored spam. But then that's kind of like bacon spam. Sort of. You know, chorizo you can make out of beef too, but. Yeah, well, chorizo has a, to me anyway, it has a different uh, flavor than, than bacon. Right, but you can make pork chorizo without spam. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. All right. Also something we'll discuss on our spam cast when we, when we get around to that. Yep. And we'll make sure that ev all of you know uh, constantly when that's coming out. We will send you constant reminders and ask you for money. Absolutely. <laughs> because if it's going to be a spam cast. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did. Okay. See, I still yes. always think of the meat. The d delicious, yep. delicious meat. Now, the other thing that you should be thinking of is hitting that subscribe button and that notification button and sending us money on Patreon. It's absolutely right. And uh, I could really use it more than before now. So, yes, Patreon. You get to hear all kinds of extras when you uh, subscribe for the expanded episodes, which is $2 an episode, 8 or $10 a month. Surely you've got 8 to $10 a month lying around. And you, you get to hear episodes a week before everybody else does. So why wouldn't you? Win-win. I know. Especially you know. for us. <laughs> yeah. We're providing all this free entertainment for you and, you know. Maybe instead of being a leech, you could give us some money. Hey. Did that help anything? I don't no, know. that just insulted everybody, and now we're <laughs> going to be down subscribers. Thank you. Yeah, well, that's why I'm, it's, you know, I'm not a marketing genius, so that's why, <laughs> probably why. Yeah. Well, but on that note, I think we're done I here. I think we're done here. Mm, yeah.